Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Magali. I'm pleased to lead this important section, namely conservation of artworks with the, which depend on technology. The professor, uh, the uh, media studies and director at the University of Amsterdam, he presented the paper How Fecal Digital Preservation Practices Are Failing Sustainability Efforts or a Call for Networks of Care. In the sequence, uh, uh, the curator Peter Tarjavis will present the paper A Palatnik New the techniques of, to restore the connected art. Finally, the artist Samiko Thiel will present the paper, three different works of art that are archived in three different collections. The collection machines, CA2AR, Supercomputer, VR, Beyond, Beyond Manzana, Manzana, AR, and Inspector Ground. This Annette, it will be a pleasure to hear you. Great, thank you so much. And I'm very much looking forward to uh, the discussion and the other presentations as well. Uh, I'm sorry about this very long title. I don't know what I was thinking when I uh, made this up. But I think uh, today's uh, discussion will nicely follow from the discussion that was taking place uh, last night, at least my last night. Um, uh, because as mentioned in the Q&A by Oliver Grau uh, yesterday, uh, he mentioned, if you update too much, you may lose some of your archive. And that's exactly what I'm going to be uh, talking about today. Uh, so here you see some, well, quite badly sketches of um, workflows, in a way, of views, of preservation views, and particularly of emulation views, an emulation workflow and a view path of what's going to happen, you know, when you start thinking about emulation. In 29, 2010, Klaus Rechert and others wrote, emulators face the same problem as do every software package and general digital objects. In other words, I would say, emulators need to be adapted to the current hardware and operating system, just as much as the digital artworks. So, there's a continuous growth in uh, updating, you could say. This is also referred to as a nested emulation. If there's no possibility to port the emulator on the new host platform, the recently outdated uh, host platform for which the emulator was created can then be emulated. So you get a box in the box, in the box, and a box, and it grows. So indeed, I mean, this recalls indeed the challenges of digital art that we've been facing for some time now. Uh, to just briefly summarize here, as the reading of all the code and software can be difficult, the economy of obsolete technology and the reliance on third, often commercial parties, makes it hard to access hardware and software over time. Similarly, perhaps one thing is available, yet it's embedding in larger networks and webs of relations poses additional challenges. And with the consequence that maintenance of software and hardware it can be very time consuming and expensive. Digital art may be cheap to buy, it's another thing to keep it running. As well, with different people working on a project simultaneously and even over time, changes to the work will happen. Moreover, artworks can evolve into other versions, which makes it hard to define what an artwork is or consists of in a digital environment. And everything all the time needs to be checked if it's still working, be repaired, be maintained, updated, etc. So perhaps a word of warning in the sense that I'm particularly looking at uh, those digital artworks that are networked, that are interactive in some sort of way. So in other words, what I think is particularly relevant of those types of artworks is that they're impermanent, they're variable, they're fragile. There are all the sort of defining conditions when you talk also about the digital preservation of these artworks. Nevertheless, though, I mean, many solutions have appeared in the last two decades to prolong this sort of functioning of digital art and also the digital tools to keep entropy at bay. They are all digital, of course. So on the short term, most of the preservation efforts work actually quite well, despite some changes to the content, aesthetics and information. Now, to come to terms to this kind of change, several discussions are organized around the acceptable amount of change. 
But something else happens with this last disgust. Huh? While the artworks need some sort of environment or adjustment to keep continuing, it's also the additional technical environment that needs to be updated. And that only goes so far. As a consequence, increasingly, as I mentioned, we see new tools and mechanisms popping up, which require also additional specialized knowledge and expertise. In short, this technical landscape is proliferating to a point where it is at times hard to know what is actually kept alive. Is it the artwork or the new layers around the artwork to keep the artwork functioning? In other words, we've entered an enduring technical rat race in which relatively small and often simple artworks can grow into large technical infrastructures and environments. All this becomes soon a dense forest of different hardware, software and people. Now this is unsustainable, I would say, on the level of the content, with every upgrade, migration, fertilization or emulation, form and content may change. Moreover, the media environment in which these projects exist further changes their aesthetic of functioning. It's also unsustainable on the type of the organizational structure. New knowledge and expertise are required to guide and solve the next technical challenge. And thirdly, on the environment, the enduring technical rat race is not sustainable in ecological sense because these practices have high energetic costs, which results in a significant carbon footprint of digital art and heritage projects. So these challenges very much bring out the paradox, what I would say, of digital sustainability. On the one hand, there's the need to keep our digital heritage safe for future research, culture, memory or evidence. On the other hand, there's the continuing need to update technical tools and methods, which poses an increasing burden on organizational infrastructures and methods, as well as on the ecological environment. Now, this ecological impact is not lost on most people. And there is a growing awareness in digital heritage organizations and museums. Looking at the literature about digital sustainability, the last years saw an impressive increase in how the sustainability challenge is tackled. For instance, by improving gallery spaces, minimizing waste, implementing energy, energy management, etc. At the same time, many organizations set their environmental goals by directing their attention to financial and staffing resources. While all these are very good efforts to reduce the ecological footprint, when considering a sustainability as a problem of governance, just as much as a problem of technical and environmental constraints, can create space to move beyond the economic or quantifiable benchmarking of sustainability and address another potential area in which digital preser preservation can become more sustainable. So my current research starts by acknowledging this inherent contradiction and in turn to think about a sustainable approach for the future of digital preservation that is both based on a deep understanding of the complex infrastructures in which these artworks prosper, and on the other hand, the integration of community networks and living memory and institutional practices. In such a scenario, collaborative networks form the basis for a more enduring infrastructure and learning from methods of living memory can reduce the sole emphasis on technical development. And this echoes Kathleen Fitzpatrick when she said in 2011, a future preservation of digital objects may be less about new tools than new socially organized systems. Systems that take advantage of the number of individuals and institutions facing the same challenges and seeking the same goals. So what does this mean? One of the conclusions that came out of my research in relation to the conservation of net art was that these artworks often are taken care of by different individuals, small organizations or groups of people with a similar aim, how to safeguard parts of the artwork. I've termed these initiative, initiatives networks of care. And from a pragmatic point of view, the characteristics of such a network, network are there is a transdisciplinary attitude, there is a combination of professionals and non-experts. It enables the creation and administration of a project that the transmission of information is helped by a common mode of sharing. Everyone in the group has access to all the documents and archives. Ideally, this would be an open system or a dynamic set of tools that is used and cared for where people can edit, um, add, manage information, but also track the changes that are made. Such a system can also be monitored by the network. An added bonus is then that if someone leaves, 
the project can continue because the content and information will always be accessible. It also allows people to take control of a shared project, thus obtaining meaning from their sort of investments. And again, this is something that was also iterated by uh, Morgan Strikot uh, last night in the discussion as well. So such a network should be dynamic so that individuals can easily move and projects can be merged or split into separate smaller or specialized groups. So in that sense, there's also a forking possibility. Now, interestingly, this social aspect of such a network is recognized more broadly, as mentioned here by Pip Lorison and Vivian van Saas, part of the uh, TAPE network. It's not the problem of non-materiality that currently represents the greatest challenge for museums in collecting performance, but of maintaining, conceived of as a process of active engagement, the networks which support the work. Moreover, what I think is important to note is that the network should be seen as inherently part of the work, and it's not merely facilitating the work or preservation for that matter. Seeing the network as an actor rather than a tool or a method turns the questions of how indiv individuals create a networks to how networks can care. This notion of care is very present in conservation practice. Collection care is pretty much at the heart of conservation. Yet here I want to try to move beyond the caring for an object by following the notion of care as described by Anna Rimol in her ethnography of healthcare and by Maria Prick de la Bella Casa, who shows how care is always, always uh, ambivalent. In this care, in this sense, care is not a matter of making well-argued individual choices, but it's something that grows out of collaborative and continuing attempts to attune knowledge. So to get a better understanding of the functioning of such a network, it's important to consider how it performs, how it changes, and how it can produce new forms of care. While it has the potential or may seem to disrupt the status quo, depending on your perspective, it's not merely about changing or choosing for one or the other. Rather, it's working towards a process of relation making, of supporting collective learning. This kind of network of care I saw actually reflected in several art projects, and I want to mention two of them. The first one is smouchette.org. Uh, quite an old uh, website since uh, 1996, oh. but still continuing. And what I think is particularly interesting here that Martin Nadam talks about characters and co as containers that carry units of meaning. Now, an interesting part of the whole Mouchette.org website is also the Mouchette network, where anyone can actually copy and edit parts of the site, but also start their own website their own mouchette in this case. But the network also functioned in another way, as was the case here when Mouchette, sorry, was trying to um, make a game and the game was translating between the different uh, mouchettes that were actually taking place. And I'm very sorry, I'm not really explaining this work at all, but I, I hope you know the work or will be able to see it soon. Uh, because there was uh, this translation going on in a game um, that reflected on the original um, well, book and also film adaptation, the, uh, the widow of the French director of the film actually came into contact with the game and was not really pleased at all, to say the least. So she sent this uh, legal cease and desist letter to Mouchette and asked her to remove the game from the website. Martina put out a call on that time at the time uh, saying like, well, I'm very sorry, but I have to take down a part of my uh, website and the project of Mouchette. At that moment, immediately several institutions, several organizations stood up and said, well, actually we will host that part of your website on our website. So a network started to form itself around the specific part of this uh, artwork. And it's still actually uh, relevant today and working. Another example that I briefly wanted to uh, share with you is uh, by Igor Straumeyer, an uh, early net artist already uh, working since the mid nineties online. And he sort of created his own network of care in a sense. 
um, this project is uh, based on an, a project that he did a couple of years uh, ago, where he started to delete all of his old artworks online. Um, in an attempt basically to say like, okay, well, these works are not functioning anymore as they should, so I might as well delete them. Out of those deleted files, he's now forming a new uh, network of caretakers. And he sent in 2016, he sent uh, 666 people an email asking them to um, take care of certain files. Two years later, he sent another um, email to 333 people asking them pre pretty much the same, same thing again. And again, last year in 2020. And as he mentions here in this lovely email, he will do this again in two years time. What I think is particularly relevant in a way is how he describes his um, work in this way. Uh, he says it's a kind of a cycle, a durational, perhaps never ending online performance with its natural rhythm being constructed, deconstructed, then reconstructed anew, but this time differently. Who knows exactly what comes afterward? But there is certainly no end to this cycle because every trace, every move you make has its consequences. What I think the project shows is a new mode of active engagement and creative use. It demonstrates an engaged way of dealing with circulation and relations in which the distributive effects are intentional, if not foreseeable, what will happen in the end. Moreover, the repetition of the performative acts of sending and potentially receiving transform the singularity of an effect into a sustained engagement. The extended period of waiting for something to happen affirms the reality of the events that unfold, even if the outcome is open. It can disappoint, but it can also be the beauty of the work. The potentiality of the event, the suspense or suggestion of infinity, of inclusion into an adventure, which may reveal itself through engaging with it. Indeed, these images are hardly interesting by themselves, but together and as part of a larger whole, they are compelling because they maintain a suggestion of potentiality. There is no logic or predictability, nor is there a story other than the one I make of it right now for you in this presentation. And while the images remain autonomous, the sparse emails symbolize a promise, a proximity, which one day may be fulfilled. In effect, the project feeds a continuous desire that keeps returning with each engagement. Now, it could very well, very well be argued that this documentation or archival collection is a new artwork. And while this could be the case, what matters is that documentation becomes alive. Rather than static and immobile, documentation here mimics the characteristics of its initial artwork, being ambiguous, performative, processual, and networked. Thank you very much. Thank you, Annette. It was a very interesting presentation. And now, you start with uh, Peter. Please, Peter. Thank you, Annette. Thank you, Magali. Um, yes, I'm um, working as an uh, organizer of exhibitions. So often we receive artworks that have a specific condition that present some problem during the exhibition because of mechanic mechanical problems, because of problems of uh, programmation and other uh, things. But specifically, I, today I would like to talk about Abraham Palachniki, a Brazilian artist, who was born in 1928 and unfortunately last year passed away due to the COVID. Um, he is one of the pioneers of uh, kinetic art, um, especially uh, in 1948 when he started to work with light, light and movements. Uh, we have been organizing, uh, my company Art Unlimited uh, has been organizing uh, seven exhibitions since 20, uh, 2013 till today. Actually, we have one exhibition on show now, a retrospective exhibition in Belo Horizonte, uh, unfortunately closed for a visitation right now. Um, what we see on this image is a um, uh, kinochrome, um, 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 Cinecromatico, 
Um, it is open. Uh, normally there is a uh, fabric on top of it. So, but I wanted to show this because I'm going to talk about how the work functions and what problems this presents for us. This here is a, um, it is a um, work in movement. It is made of motors, um, of uh, lamps, light bulbs, incandescent light bulbs that slowly move around. Um, his work is um, done as a movement, as a poetic uh, construction of a visual experience. And of course, if it uh, doesn't function, it doesn't exist. And that is the main problem of his work. Um, he, his works are uh, functioning with electricity, with small motors, with incandescent light bulbs. So if one of the light bulbs burns, the work is incomplete. If one of the motors doesn't function, the work stops. When the work is not on, it is just a flat screen without anything. So the artwork doesn't exist. And this has been a recurrent problem. Most of these machines were uh, done in the 1950s and early 60s. And the artist bought the light in the candescent light bulbs at this time and bought a lot of them. And then over the time, he has been constructing these machines using the stock he had, but he ran out of stock. And the cinematic works were sold to museums, were sold to collectors. And from that moment on, they were on, under the care of people that didn't know how it functioned, exactly how it had to be restored because the artist didn't give any instructions. So here, here we have an, another work. It is an um, objeto synergical, a kinetic object. It functions, it is um, turning around. It is visible, here the structure is visible. It is an, like a an constellation, it slowly moves and makes a little noise because it's all mechanical. It's made of, um, of an, very simple mechanical constructions, mechan mechanisms that also need a lot of maintenance, not only during the exhibition, but also when they are at the collector's home or at the museums. What happened is what, when we make these exhibitions, we ask for synchromatics and for object synergicals. And we discover that many of them are not working. The collector says, oh, I'm sorry, it didn't work. I don't know to whom, to whom to send it to repair it. In the past, we had we sent it to the artist. Often we sent it to the artist for him to repair. And his son also helped us a lot because he is now, he knows about how the, the, the work functions and so on. But still, it is a problem. His first uh, synchromatic device was in 1948 till 51. A very um, mechanical question. It was not. Uh, it not. It didn't have even have motors. It was uh, by. It was moved by hand. The first one that was moving was in 1951 when he participated at the Biennale of São Paulo, and he made an enormous machine, and it attracted a lot of attention of the public and of the uh, art critics. But since then, he made a lot of studies, and so it was. Um, it was not an, um, it was, he was an engineer. He was, for, um, basically, he, he was, um, he had a university training as an engineer. And then he became an artist. So he makes the machines thinking from an uh, engineer point of view. Here, you can see how he studies. He makes the constructions and make mechanisms, but all very handmade. There is no high techniques. This is the machine open. Uh, so you can see the several light bulbs, different colors and the motors and uh, mechanisms that make the thing turn around. And what you see underneath, here you can see the functioning of the, um, of the inside. Uh, lamps go on and off and these uh, shapes turn around, so they give different shapes, different shadows. 
And this is the computer. This is the hard disk. And it's amazing because it functions. Yeah? Um, each nail is connected to an electric wire. And on top of this goes this comb and it circles around with a small motor, it's very slowly. Every time this touches one of the, um, one of the, the, the um, nails, one of the lights goes on. When it doesn't touch any nail, the light goes off. It's very simple but it's very difficult to maintain because uh, this wears uh, when you use it. And so you have to revise it regularly. This is the study for, this, for the hard disk and yeah? how to, to make the lamps go in a certain sequence. The problem, the, mo the biggest problem is that light bulbs burn. And when this happened in the past, the collector just went to a shop and bought a new one, a new color lamp. But the colors were different. Uh, over the years, the colors were not, it's not the same as the artist bought at the time. They were not anymore available. Um, and also the artist painted some of the bulbs himself. He developed a technique of using a certain kind of, of, of paint that was not burned by the heat of the lamp. And so people tried to find lamps more or less in the same color. But with this, the character of the work, the visual aspect of the work changed. And then another problem occurred. When you use incandescent lamps, bulbs, they start burning with less intensity over the years. And they start to make different designs, different compositions. So how do we deal with that? The artist never thought about it. And he was a little bit the same. He said, okay, I'll give you some others, change. But they were not always the same as he had used in the past because he, always, he also started buying lamps in shops when he was there. So nowadays we have several of these um, cinechromaticos that are not anymore the original works that the artist created. And I talked with him very often. I said, listen, Palachniki, we have to do something because your work is being destroyed because there are two museums that don't show your work anymore because it's burnt and they don't know how to repair it. But he was very reluctant in thinking about solutions. He just, um, he just said, well, you know, you, you resolve, you, you, you find a solution, please. And we found a solution. Um, our illuminator, our specialist in illumination, he developed a new um, form of repairing these works. So what we do is we try to find out which are the original light bulbs that are inside and use these bulbs, uh, open them with a special technique and put a LED light inside with the same intensity and the same color, light color as the light bulbs, the incandescent light bulbs. And in this way, we restored several of these burned lamps with the original color. When I told the artist, he said, oh, fine, okay, yeah. do so. So this do so we took as, an, um, as a form of being authorized to do this with other works. It is not, so here there were, one of them was burned and was not anymore the original lamp. So I got some burned lamps from the artist with the original, the original burned uh, lamps, the original bulbs. So we could use the colors that he was using in the past to restore because here there was a different color of green uh, that one of the collectors had put. So the work now here is uh, restored. The whole sequence is still is now visible. The problem is that um, we would like uh, to do this with not only the works that we receive for an exhibition. Uh, now in the current exhibition, 
we have a very curious case because we found a um, synchromatic from a private collector that had never been exposed before. And we, when we opened the work in the exhibition, we discovered that more than half of the bulbs, the light bulbs were changed for new ones. Which means that it is a very brightly colored work, but I'd, I'd wonder if this was the intention of the artist. So um, what we are trying to do, and this is something we can discuss huh, in this, this uh, webinar, is what can we do? We are a private company that organizes exhibitions. We have found a solution to preserve certain works of an artworks of an artist, but we would really love to extend this to the collections, the, the public collections. Um, unfortunately, he, he uh, wrote, he made approximately 33 of these uh, artworks, these light artwork. And we know only half of them where they are and six of them in Brazilian public collections. So from two collections, we had the authorization to restore these works. And we are trying to contact them now to show the results and to propose a program, uh, not a commercial program, by the way. Uh, we, we don't want to get money from this. It's just, uh, we want to keep this information available and restore these artworks and give all these artworks a kind of a uh, manual uh, together. So where we write down everything we know about these artworks and how they function and how we did the restoration so that in the, in the future people can study this and eventually make have better ideas or better solutions. So um, one of the and then the funny thing is um, we rest, I, I in one of these exhibitions we had an apparello um, cinecromatico and from a private collector, someone I know very well very befriended and when the work was at the exhibition we discovered that there were several lamps that hadn't been functioning for years he was used to this work as it was and slowly he was becoming used to other move other changes in the work and then i phoned him i said listen can i change the light bulbs that are burnt he said okay and then I said, there are some light bulbs that are at the end of their lives. They're very, very, um, they, they're losing their brightness. What do you want us to do? I said, okay, change, change. Then after the exhibition, we brought the work back to his home and he put it to functioning. And he started yelling at me. I said, you've destroyed the artwork. I said, come on. You remember, you said, yes, but you destroyed it. Go, go back, make it, make it function again, as it was. I said, but this was not the way as the artist delivered it in the 1950s or the 1960s. And then he said, well, let me think some days. And I thought, well, oh, there's coming a juridical claim. I will be broke uh, because I destroyed a million dollar work, artwork. What can I... Well, what will I have to sell to pay all these debts? And then after a few days, he said, listen, I have been sitting in front of this work and I have had it on for hours and hours and I'm getting used to it. Okay, so <laughs> thank you very much and uh, we'll talk about it later. Thank you, Peter, the, the presentation. And now you will have uh, another interesting uh, presentation, Tamiko, to you, please. So thank you for inviting me. <laughs> I love that story. Um, I think it's uh, what Peter just said is really the conservationist nightmare, but it's exactly what you have to deal with. So I want to start out talking about a, a work of mine that doesn't may, might not seem to fit in because it's a supercomputer. It was the world's first commercial artificial intelligence supercomputer invented by Danny Hillis, uh, who I got to meet when um, he and I were both graduate students and I was in mechanical engineering 
uh, as a product designer and, and he was in the MIT artificial intelligence lab studying under Marvin Minsky. So I um so uh, after after I graduated actually he sort of pounced on me and asked me to be the um, product designer for uh, for the computer he had been des designing for his PhD thesis because he had just started a startup company this is 1983 to actually build the machine and the big difference was. Yeah, at that point in the early 80s, the supercomputers, even if they were called parallel uh, supercomputers, had maybe four or maybe I think the most was maybe eight processors. And this one had six more than 64,000, but very small one-bit processors. And the, the reason why it could function uh, was that it was all these processors were connected together in this 12 dimensional Boolean N cube of which more later. So the whole idea was that the supercomputers at the time were running up into a bottleneck. One processor was uh, just not fast enough. And Danny said, well, you know, the human brain has 80 billion, very simple. Uh, processors, they, they're called neurons. So if we can try and build massively parallel machines, then maybe they can uh, start thinking like, uh, like, uh, in, you know, like uh, intelligent beings. So um, he asked me to uh, build this machine. The machine was uh, the fastest supercomputer in the world in 1989. And then when the company went bankrupt in 1986, it, we went into the AI winter and everyone said it was a failure. So in 2015, when uh, I found out that the Museum of Modern Art in New York was interested in acquiring one. I started doing a lot of back research, talking to Danny and said, was it a dead end like everyone says on the internet? And he just laughed and said, you know, uh, Sergey Brin is a co-founder of Google. He learned how to do parallel programming on the connection machine as an undergraduate. And in fact, the uh, MapReduce algorithm, which was uh, one of the major components of Google's success as a search engine was based on Danny Hillis's whole programming paradigm for parallel processing. And then also in 2010, Google bought Danny's second company, MetaWeb, and uh, his co-founder, John Janandrea, went to become head of AI. So there's this direct line from thinking machines and the connection machine into Google. And you know how powerful Google is in the artificial intelligence realm. So, it, uh, so you know, uh, first, MoMA said, well, it's, it's, it might have been a failure, but it was an interesting looking failure. And, I, and then I found this information. No, it wasn't a failure. It was actually the basis of the AI that we use today, now that we have machines that are powerful enough to do what we were trying to do back then. Then they said, well, yes, but is it, uh, is, is it important for design? also. And then I had my ace in the hole, my friend Joanna Hoffman, who was Steve Jobs' right hand, uh, both on the very first Macintosh project. And then when Steve got uh, thrown out of Apple and started the next company, um, he, uh, she told me years and years later, he saw the connection machine, uh, a photograph of the connection machine when it first came out in 1986 and said to Joanna, find me the designer of the connection machine. I want them to build my next computer. Um, and unfortunately, <laughs> unfortunately, I'd moved to uh, Germany to become an art student. I had left MIT uh, environment and the startup life, and um, she didn't have my contact information. So she said, I'm sorry, she's gone to Europe to become an art student. But, you know, when I was talking to MoMA about this, I said, look at uh, what he did then with the next cube. It's a perfect black square, a perfect black box. And look at his visual design sense before. The Macintosh was cute and cuddly and friendly maybe, but look at what he did from the next cube on. It was visually sublime. And then the curator Paola Antonelli talked with uh, with uh, Joanna and uh, confirmed that it was really the sort of the epiphany of seeing the connection machine that made Jobs realize that the that these technical boxes could be something more sublime than just a very useful tool. So with that, so uh, to to talk about um, 
the uh, the archiving of this machine, you know, back in uh, back in 1991, the machine was replaced by its successor with a very different form. I wasn't involved in the design of that, and I realized that um, not only was the uh, the the CM2 that I designed, CM1, CM2, going to sort of vanish from memory, but I also realized that no one realized what my part in the design was. I have this bad habit of always saying we, and part of it I found out is that if a if a you know an adult man says we, then they figure oh he was in control, and if a 25 year old woman says we. They figure, well, she was she was like writing down what everyone else was saying. So I, I wrote an article um, as I realized I was being writ erased from history. I wrote an article on the design of the connection machine of the concepts that went into it. I got it published in design journals and um, and that was really the basis uh, for my very personal desire to um, to record my place in the development of this machine. That was the beginning of my effort to archive the design of the machine. So this is the drawing that I made when um, the Nobel physicist Richard Feynman was working with us um, during the summer for fun. He also used the uh, connection machine to do his first simulations of the quantum computers that was also considered a nutty idea then and you know now is, is starting to become a reality. So he said, okay, we're, we're going to use a 12 dimensional Boolean N cube to wire everything together. And of course I was the one who had to actually wire it. I had to actually you know, say, okay, this is how you're going to connect every single processor to another. So I I couldn't just understand it theoretically like he did. <laughs> I had to do, understand it physically. And this is the drawing I came up with after processing through a, a, a number of his explanations. And this is a 12 dimensional cube of cubes and you see this repeating cube structure. And this is, this is the machine as it, as it finally looked. This is how the machine is exhibited in a computer museum. Uh, they just take the hardware and they put it, uh, you know, somewhere on their floor and they put a label on it. And so for, for the computer museums, and this is in several um, computer museums, then that's, that was always enough and that's only how it was exhibited. For the Museum of Modern Art, of course, they wanted to understand um, more about you know how did the design communicate to the people who saw it to the people who used it so uh, for for them it was um, the article that I had written was uh, was really key and part of what I described in that article is how Danny and I came up with this logo for the t-shirt that you see us wearing. Um, this is uh, Danny in the middle and I'm down here. We both got have the same t-shirt on and it shows that cube of cubes. But if you look closely, then inside of some of those boxes are sort of like pom-poms and they're connected together with wiggly lines. So, so the cube of cubes is the hardware structure, the wiring, and the pom-poms are the software. And the software data structures could connect to each other independently of the actual wires. And this really was at a very early stage in the development of, of the physical machine, basically how we explained the concept of how the machine was built, how it was constructed, how it functioned to the outside world. And to make a very long story very short, uh, you see that hardware structure of the cube of cubes in the black form of the machine. But it was also very important to me that the machine be able to show what it was thinking about. So what we ended up doing, you see on, on the left, one of the processor boards, you see those chips have 16 processors and there's usually a status light next to it that says whether it's working, is it getting electricity? So we moved all those lights to the edge of the board, made the doors of the machine translucent so when the machine was on and it and it was running then of course you could program of course what the lights said and the and uh, the legend is the very first thing that came up when they turned on the machine was I blink therefore I am 
um, it might be an apocryphal story, but basically the, my idea was that uh, if you programmed it so every time you're using a processor chip, it's on, then you can actually see what the machine is thinking. And, uh, I've, uh, and one programmer actually said that's exactly how he used it and he could just run his program and if all the lights were only on on a small part, then he said, oh no, I've programmed it incorrectly. I have to go back and make sure that as many lights as possible are running simultaneously. So luckily, of course, for, for a MoMA, this was very important to convey because this is how the machine communicated its own structure to anyone who looked at it. And this is, um, let's see if I can uh, get this uh, to run. Um, back in the 80s, there were very few uh, video cameras around. You know, they were expensive and um, you didn't always just have them in your back pocket. This is about the only video that shows the lights. And the interesting thing is I used this video, I gave it to the uh, engineers who were um, making a, um, a, a simulation grid of LEDs uh, and, and said, this is, this is the only video I have of the machine actually running. And the, and the engineers who worked at Thinking Machines for longer than me said, you know, it's, it's too fast. And then I finally realized what was going on. It was uh, the connection machine was replaced by the CM5 machine, very different with just a, you know, a display of lights. It wasn't showing the lights from inside and that ran really slowly. So people who had worked uh, for many, many years with the company, much longer um, than, than I uh, had, implanted in their brains the speed of the lights from this other machine that came afterwards. So there uh, you have the question, okay, whose memory was, was right? What is the correct thing? You can always say, well, the lights are programmable. So, you know, it could be whatever you want. So there's not really one real, um, real way that, that the lights have to be blinking. But this is all, of course, um, as Peter <laughs> stressed, if you don't record this in some way, how are they going to know? So I'm very, very happy that I was still alive when, uh, when um, MoMA took uh, interest in the machine and, uh, and that I was able to at least convey my information on the machine. So the, so the next piece I want to talk about is called Beyond Manzanar, and it was actually my first uh, virtual reality artwork, and it was finished back in 2000. It was acquired uh, two years later by the San Jose Museum of Art in Silicon Valley, and then uh, shown from, um, from then on in a number of exhibits. So this shows the very first uh, exhibit in the San Jose Museum. And you can see that the light is, is not so good. It's, uh, it's an open space. There was light coming in from a security light above the doorway. Uh, the projector was not very strong. Um, there's this big crate here because we were running off of a desktop um, Windows 98 computer. And there was an amplifier powering the little speakers there. But you see the general configuration uh, um, of uh, this um, a joystick that looks like it could have been made by hand in the Manzanar incarceration camp, and then the project, and you are steering your way through the virtual world with that joystick. So when we went uh, to archive it, then uh, the description of the, of the space was important, but the space as it had been shown and the space how I would want to have it shown. And then with the hardware, uh, I specified, okay, uh, the, um, you know, the, the PC, what we have right now um, is, is not really not adequate. So if we can migrate it to a more powerful PC, a more powerful projector, better speakers, um, better joystick hardware, that's fine. What has to stay the same is this handmade looking joystick box and tripod and the relationship of the user to the screen. 
And then the other problem was that um, that the videos that I could make at that time, just like this really lousy one you saw of the connection machine, were also not very good. So here's uh, the actual uh, pages from my installation description with the actual installation and the ideal installation, um, saying, you know, if you show it again, please try and meet my ideals and don't take the actual one as the way it has to be. Um, let's see if I, I can see if I can uh, show you a bit of the the video. You see how bad the quality of the video was. It was really fuzzy and foggy, and this was the best uh, recording that I could make at the time. Um, uh, so I did a video walkthrough of that and then um, augmented it with this description here where I say, okay, at this time in the video, what's happening is you've in, in, entered this scene and in order to move to the next scene after that, you have to go to this door or that door. So along with the video, I have this very... Uh, detailed explanation of what's happening. It turns out the structure is a simple loop, sort of like beads in a necklace. You always uh, have to go from one bead to the next, one scene to the next, but you come back in the end to the beginning. And then lots of screenshots, because these show the quality of the image that people were seeing at the time. And if I had just left the video, then people would say, oh, well, it looked pretty lousy in those days. It doesn't have to look any better. Um, just really quickly, what the content of the piece was about was the uh, uh, one layer of the historic incarceration of Japanese Americans in, in incarceration camps during World War II because the government said uh, no, Japan, no person of Japanese ancestry, even down to one sixteenth drop of Japanese blood can ever be loyal to the U.S. And then a parallel layer from my co-artist, Sar Hushmand, on how during the uh, Iranian hostage crisis in 1978 to 80, there were similar threats to incarcerate Iranian Americans. So we have these parallel levels that we depict, for instance, with these archival newspaper articles that are floating in the air. Uh, and, uh, and then also because the Japanese Americans really did build gardens in Manzanar as places of refuge, of, of uh, uh, within the confinement of the ring of, of um, mountains surrounding the camp, uh, you could think for just some minutes, you were maybe in paradise. But if you move too much, then you would see the guard towers, you would see the the, the, the fence and you would fall back into prison. And that's exactly what happens here. Your own movement takes uh, you into the garden, but then that your movement also makes the garden disappear. You fall back into the prison camps. There's uh, photographs of, of immigrants trying to adapt, trying to assimilate, trying to be good Americans. And then of course, images of, uh, of, of the incarceration where these people, two thirds of whom were uh, for, were uh, below the age of majority and were native born American citizens, but were imprisoned uh, during the course of the war. So when we talk about preserving this, um, it turns out that the platform that I use at that time is the virtual reality modeling language that came up in 1995 as one of the first platforms that allowed uh, uh, interactive 3D computer graphics, what we call virtual reality, to run on mere PCs instead of $100,000 workstations. Now this is an open source standard and you can see there on the left, that is the actual uh, text that is uh, defining how the roof is built, how the wall is built. I did not use the 3D modeling program. I literally typed everything into a text file and said, okay, this wall has this vertex and that vertex and this vertex and that vertex. So in some sense, you know, you've got the images, JPEGs and, and uh, PNGs, you've got some sound files. And then um, this, the actual programs um, is the 3D uh, is is the 3D content. There are no models apart from this text file. And because it's an open source, anyone at any given time, if they have if they understand how to build 3D rendering engines, can go back and use this open source standard and and rewrite a browser that would run uh, this this code. So um, so 
also because I was showing Beyond Manzanar uh, again and again over time, each time I would migrate it when the uh, when the um, uh, operating system changed, and the uh, the company um, that wrote the initial browser, was co-founded by my husband. It went bankrupt in 2002, but a very good friend of ours had actually written the 3D browser and he went to another company and that company is still existing and they migrated it to all the different operating systems. So I've migrated it many times um, over the course of the 20 years, uh, that um, 21 years now that, it, that it's been alive. And, um, you know, otherwise the, the image and sound files were all completely normal. Um, and then, you know, in 2017, I was showing the piece in an art fair in, in New York, and I took the time to upgrade a lot of the images uh, to higher resolution versions. You know, the original code was 35 megabytes, including everything. Well, not including the browser, but uh, the, the, the program itself and all of the assets. And then now it's uh, a little bit larger, um, but, but basically that plus, uh, you know, I went back to the San Jose Museum of Art when I knew that they were going to exhibit it in 2019 and said, I can give you in addition to your original version of the code that run that runs on you know uh, um, Windows 98 or XP, I can give you a version that is looks better, runs better on a Windows 10. So if you just buy a $500 Windows laptop, then we can upgrade the piece and it almost looks cinematic. And on the basis of of my old instructions of how it ideally should look. This is how it looked in 2019 and was just spectacular. It was really, really beautiful. So, um, so that was, uh, you know, there'll, there'll be another problem if, if the Windows is uh, no longer compatible, uh, backwards compatible, if bit management goes out of business, that's another hurdle. But because they have the original version from, from 2000 and they have this version from 2000, 2017, then they have, they, you know, it's always easier to emulate a much, much older version because it had to be much, much simpler back then. So, you know, maybe they'll even, if they have to emulate it, maybe they'll start by emulating the original version um, because that'll be easier to do. I don't know. But they have the options and, and you know, part of of, of, of my maintenance is giving them uh, as many packages as, as I can generate. So the archival project I'm working on now um, was that in 2018, I got a commission from Christiana Paul to create an augmented reality installation for the sixth floor terrace of the Whitney Museum. Now she did this big show that took up the entire sixth floor called Programmed Rules, Codes and Choreographies in Art and asked me to create a new piece uh, for uh, uh, for that exhibit. Now, um, the big problem was that I had been using one platform called Layar, which came out of Amsterdam, uh, for eight years to do uh, to do all my augmented reality. And just to make sure, I called, uh, I, I contacted the developer support at Layar and said, "I've got this very high-profile exhibit. It's going to run into 2019. Uh, will there be any?" Any problems with the servers and they came back and said well actually we're turning off our servers at the end of the year um, you should not use our platform you should not use our app because we will not exist and there I was going there was no other app that I could use to make this piece at that point it didn't have the right type of augmented reality and then my husband, um, Peter, who you might remember, had co-founded the Black Sun Interactive. So he had been working with 3D um, uh, interactive technology from the developer side. He said, I'll take a month off work and I'll see if I can write an app that will replace the entire functionality of the layer app. If after a month I can't do it, we have to turn down the commission. But luckily he was able to do it and, um, and we, produce this piece that I call that we call unexpected growth. We essentially put the Whitney underwater. So the whole background is blue. And then you've got this colorful, beautiful 
coral reef that is on the uh, uh, on the terrace. But if you look closely, you realize that it's made out of plastic garbage. And we had another aspect, uh, which was server driven, was that uh, we, we looked to see how many people are downloading the app on that day. And the more people who downloaded it, the more the corals bleach. So if you come on a Friday or Saturday when they're showing the piece, then uh, you might actually see almost white corals. So that's a server component, which of course, as, as, uh, as you probably know, is uh, a little bit more difficult to, um, to maintain, but it's really a very, just a simple concept. It just has to say, okay, you know, how many people have, uh, have uh, downloaded the app and then send me a percentage to change the, um, uh, to change the, uh, the, the, the color. So, um, so that could be very easily duplicated even if the current server we're running doesn't work. Here's how it was shown in the Whitney. When you come into the space, you, you see uh, in front of you these two 13-inch uh, uh, iPads and they're set up so that you see the corals against the backdrop of the um, of, of the Manhattan sky. So you can immediately pick them up there as the mother is doing, showing it to her child who's too small to look directly in them. Um, and there's also instructions how you can download it on your own smartphone and, and, and says, please go out on the terrace and take a look at it. So um, let's see, I might just run a little bit of this. Um, so here's how you would see it on the, on the terrace in your own smartphone. Um, you see how the background uh, is, is green or blue, well, it's kind of a turquoise back background and how the, the, they are animated. So of course we made video documentation um, to represent it and the videos are good enough these days. So um, it gives a pretty accurate idea of, of what it looks like and the sort of animation it has. But beyond that, uh, um, we're going to give them also the Unity projects that we use, for instance, to generate the corals using uh, L systems. So you see on the left, Here's, uh, here's uh, the, the very simple model I made of a flip-flop. And then with the L system, which is essentially uh, an, an algorithm for, for uh, rules of growth that are used in a lot of plants and, and in corals, uh, you see the coral structure, uh, the quote unquote coral structure that came out of it. So they'll have the whole Unity program that has the, the different uh, um, L system uh, programs in it. You can see at the bottom um, the axiom here. I'm not going to translate it for you, but it just it means take the take my flip flop, transpose it one one unit, uh, rotate it, and then repeat it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So they'll have that, and then um, the other thing is that after the uh, exhibit, um, uh, Peter took the unexpected growth app that he wrote and then turned it into a more general purpose um, app we, uh, he calls Arpoise and made it open source. So uh, that's what um, we use for all of our subsequent augmented reality pieces. And, um, and uh, we're now working with a project in, in San Jose called Hidden Histories of San Jose Japantown and trying to build up a community of people that hopefully will also at some point include developers who will help uh, P Peter then develop the platform further. But um, one component of it uh, you know, we, we create in Unity, we create the, the, the models and, um, and there they are prefabs you see uh, then maybe in this uh, web interface here for our poise. Uh, here's where we say, okay, we want a, a bush made out of Zori, out of flip-flops. But then uh, here down below is the animation that says, okay, when when it uh, when it's created, it should rotate for a length of ten seconds from uh, from zero to forty and back again around the y-axis. So basically, the whole the the um, the a lot of the Arpoise uh, backend uh, porpoise backend that we use um, to position the the piece and and deal with basic properties like scale and any animations uh, and any interactivity is also in these. XML files, which which is you know machine not only machine readable but human readable. So basically, the system itself forms part of the documentation, and um, and would be 
relatively easy uh, to replicate as we indeed took uh, uh, made a replica of an, the original open source uh, porpoise uh, front end for layer and turned it into the porpoise, uh, not front end, back end, uh, turned it into the porpoise back end for our poise. Um, it is on GitHub and at some point we realized that it had been added to the GitHub Arctic Code Vault, which is a thousand year hardened film stored in a uh, decommissioned coal mine in Norway. So, um, so the RPOIS is not only an open source, but it's also archived in, in what the software world hopes is a, a relatively long lived uh, facility. And that's where we are now. I'm still in the middle of, of the archival process and it's taking a very long time. But part of that is because the Whitney is very, very detailed. They gave me an incredibly long file with a lot of questions. Um, and, then, and then I have to like prep prep all of the, uh, you know, prep, prep the code, prep uh, the documentation, prep the Unity programs. So it's taking quite a long time, but that means that it will be um, uh, pretty well documented also with my intent. They are asking, you know, what should be preserved as it is, what could get better. And, um, and the other thing is that we have already migrated it last year from the original uh, dedicated unexpected growth platform to the RPOIS platform. So now we will not do more migrations on the unexpected growth platform. We will have just one single, the RPOIS platform. And like I said, we are hoping to get a community that will get involved in helping us maintain it. So that should, that, you know, took a little bit more time right now at the beginning, but uh, moving forward, that should help us preserve it. Thanks for your patience. I hope that wasn't really too long. Thank you, Kamik, it was amazing. <laughs> it works. Well, um, we had you know, a large presentations with many issues related to the theme of this meeting. To start uh, the, discu the discussion, I tried to propose a general question and some specific questions for each. We have so many, so many questions in the chat for all. And um, I, um, I hope you have time to, to, uh, to answer every question. My general question is, documentation is the most pow powerful tools of the preservation of contemporary art. I think you can already say that there has been a great advance in terms of the specialized bibliograph bibliography on semantic issues new methodologies and tools for documentation. One question that is always controversial there is the artistic intentions and their participation in the documentation or preservation process. What are the limits of artistic participation? How to deal with the changes in artistic intent of the years? How to negotiate the discrepancies between the artist's intention and the real possibilities or the honored interests. I, I think in, in, in my presentation, I, I, um, I, I made it pretty clear that I try to be very involved in that. And maybe mm -hmm. because, because really from the age essentially of 25, um, I realized I really wanted to preserve the connection machine. I started from a very young age, actually before I became a professional artist, uh, to think about um, about intent, um, because mm -hmm. I realized with the connection machine that the in my intent in the design mm -hmm. wasn't really understood by anyone by except for me. So if I didn't write it down, if I didn't describe mm -hmm. it, no one would know what that intent was. And, and that was really key for me. So, um, so that was, gave me perhaps a, a, from uh, the beginning, um, you know, the opposite of, uh, of what, poor, what Peter is having to deal with, mm -hmm. you know, with, with, with his artist who says, that's your problem, you know. Uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. Would like to Peter or Annette? talk about this from our, my point of view as an exhibition maker of course the most important thing is that the, the thing works 
And at the moment that the exhibition is on and the work starts, stops functioning, you want to do anything to have it work again. On the other hand, the artist might interfere in a way that interferes with the original idea of the artwork. Uh, in the case of, of, of um, Palacniki, this could be a problem because his works are very uh, handmade. They're very simple yeah. construction, yeah, simple techniques, right. simple mechanics. If you start to do it better, because you can do it better, you can make it smoother and um, uh, failure proof, but that's not the idea. The idea was that it makes noise, that it is, it makes, it's a little bit harsh to work. If you ask for, uh, to, to the public, the youngers, especially, if you talk about the uh, cinechromatic works, the works that work with light and movements, if they see it, they think it's a computer, it's a screen. Therefore, in the exhibition, we, we show this open uh, work because we want them to know this is mechanical. This is not a screen. This is not something you can make on your computer. And then they start to think, wow. Eh? They think it's a bit awkward eh? because if you can do it on the computer, why do we work it, do it this way? And that is the danger that people in the future might say, well, come on, what's the, what, what's the deal? Eh? It has to work. So let's, let's make a good film of it and we put it on screen. Who will see the difference? I know the difference. And, uh, so it's very difficult. And the artist would interfere because he was really, he would change the color, I think. And it is his full right to do so. But if the work is in a collection, especially when it's in a museum collection, which has the uh, obligation to keep the work as it is for future generations, how do we deal with that? And the artist says, oh, come on, I'll change it. I'll do it for you. But then it becomes a new work. You, you told it yourself and you did it at Tamiko, that you, you had your own work preserved at the museum, but you gave a new version next to it. I think that's very intelligent, but in the way it, with some works like the works of, of um, Palachniki, that doesn't function. Yeah, and, and that's that's really important to be clear about. And my experience with the uh, with the um, San Jose Museum made me realize that the curator is very interested in, uh, or often very interested in how did this work function when it first came out, because that is then a moment in time. And so, you know, I was not surprised at all when when uh, when Christiana Paul at the Whitney said, "No, we want to archive, uh, you know, the original version." So, so I'm always assuming that um, you'll want to uh, archive the original version to have that that uh, that timestamp, and then uh, and then you know I'll make it clear uh, what uh, what I need to what I really want to have stay and what I really want to have improved. And then, you know, especially once I die, um, it's, it's entirely the, the opinion of the person uh, putting on the exhibit. Uh, do, do we show, um, do we show the, the, the best possible version right now, or do we show the original one? And I understand and accept both of those, uh, both of those as being legitimate uh, interests and, legit and interesting ways to look at media art. Thank you, Amico. Annette, would you like to talk something about this general question? Yeah, thanks. I mean, it's it's a very hard question in many ways. And I think in the end, it's, it's going to be different for every artist. Uh, indeed. And we've got the extremes here in a way already. It's like the one says like, oh, well, do whatever. I don't care. And the other says like, well, I actually do care. And I'm telling you how to do it. Um, so it is, and that's one of the most difficult things in a way with, with art conservation, it's like a case on case basis. Uh, however, though, that's easy to be said right now, but what happens indeed in 50 years, if some of these works are, you know, fragments, half repaired, half working, half functioning, um, and who's the, gonna decide then? Who's, what, what is gonna be done? And I think that's when it becomes really interesting rather than it being dangerous, I think that's where it becomes really uh, crucial, uh, particularly to, to indeed invest also in, in the documentation of the work and uh, not only in, in the intentions, but okay, what are indeed 
what has been done with it? What are the users? What are the audiences doing with it? And, and how is it conceived within the context? Because I think the context of a work and when it appeared is crucial to understand it. I mean, what does it mean to have a light bulb in relation to an um, LCD or a LED light? It's, it's a huge difference. And it's not only about the light, there's also something about the technical uh, history there that is incredibly relevant, I think. Same with, yeah, Tamika's beautiful example of the computer, you know, it's this huge bulky box in a way. What does it say about that time? We, we can't imagine that being the case anymore right now if we talk about computers almost. So I think it's about also documenting and understanding um, what the context was at a certain moment, but then also how to translate that into a new context. So there you come into the intention of the work and the artist and you try to find ways It's like, well, how can I convey what was happening then into the moment right now? And I think, again, um, uh, Tamika's example of the VR installation is, is so interesting because the content is still relevant today. The means of accessing is still relevant today as well. So there is this beautiful interplay of technology and content that go together and that are constantly meaningful. I don't know if it will be in, in 50 years time, but certainly for now, I can totally see how that, uh, how that was preserved in, in this way. But perhaps in, in 20 years or even, uh, we will say like, oh, now we have to do this very differently. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, when we started, well, to, started talking uh, before this webinar, uh, we mentioned Namjoon Pike. And Namjoon Park has a very specific problem. He uses old television sets. And many of them are um, made with techniques that are not being used again uh, anymore. Oh, so oh. there are no substitutes. And I was just telling that in, at one of our exhibitions, we had a work of his with a very small uh, white, black and white TV um, with a um, cathode uh, screen which is something you can't find anymore. And then it burned during, during the exhibition. And what do you do? Yeah, we cannot replace it. So by, luckily enough, we found an old shop that was, mm -hmm. the owner was collecting old TVs. And so we were able to replace the screen, but that is once in a lifetime. And in the future, that will not any be, be any more possible. So we have to find solutions for these cases because they will happen every time again. Yeah, I remember also when I was a curator at the Netherlands Media Art Institute that we wanted to show an internet-based artwork that was working on different search engines and uh, chat rooms. And the work wasn't, yeah, it was just about a year old and we had to slow down our internet connection because we just had this fiber optic now in Amsterdam installed, which was great for everyone except for that artwork because people were trying to move around into the chat rooms that was a sort of 3D visualization and they just could, couldn't make it because it went too fast. So yeah, the, the thing is that things change more and more rapidly. And so solutions need to be found um, also from a very different perspective, I think. And the the point about uh, about things getting faster, you know, internet connections, but also processors getting faster is, is a is a big problem. So that uh, there, I think some some sort of, uh, for instance, video documentation is is really useful uh, to to show what the interaction was like originally and then you can start seeing okay you know be, because maybe you think well it was supposed to be like that you were supposed to be able to you know move around too fast and sort of get lost but um but if you have the original uh, uh video documentation you see no 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 this is an artifact of uh, the fact that everything is running faster now and that's something that that um, the artist might not have thought about, um, because it's not it's often not clear what is limiting the speed. But for instance, the speed of of walking around the space uh, with a joystick uh, is also changing. And um, and I'm hoping that you know people will look at the videos and say no 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 it was supposed to be slow. Well, um, unfortunately, we don't have much time, so it's like. Uh, um, you read um, to answer the question of the, the, the chat. 
Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I'm I'm really going through the whole list at the moment now on YouTube, yeah, and yeah. it's amazing. the the the, yeah. the level of questions is super high, and I'm I'm really yeah. triggered by them as well. What I find a sort of uh, resonates in a sense is also well, how can we indeed further think through the documentation? Uh, just uh, move away from the sort of staticness of the photograph, the the video even. Uh, that becomes this object and how can we you know think through this uh, idea of documentation more and, and to expand it more in the sense to yeah to show you to show a future audience in a way uh, as to what was really important in a work and that's what I also meant indeed by saying like well what to me is really important is that we come to terms to that things are changing and that we actually take advantage of that change and that we, 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 we transform that into also other, other ideas about an installation perhaps in, in, the, in the sense of a form when the form was not really necessary or something like that. So that, that it becomes more creative translation process in that sense as well, because I think it's gonna be inevitable that we, we need to let, you know, we won't be able to save everything. You know, there will be of course always certain pieces that will remain working and that people Put a lot of, lot of effort in, luckily, uh, but a lot of things won't. And um, so, in order to have some sort of sense of what it was like, uh, yeah, the documentation in all kinds of different ways and by all kinds of different people. So, and, and here, I think the adagium of the more the better is certainly a case in point that we need not just one museum documenting something, uh, but we need a lot of uh, documentation from all kinds of people. Thank you, Annette. Uh, Peter? Um, yes, there are some questions that have more or less the same uh, question is, what do you think as a producer, um, as, as an, somebody who works also with art uh, conservation uh, when doing an exhibition, about being a co-author of artistic production? Uh, because if we deal with the artworks and we, we work we re restore them or we repair them, we are kind of being the co-author in this piece. And that is a bit true, you know, um, Annette said, yeah, listen, if you change a light bulb, which is an incandescent light to um, LED light, it is not the same lamp anymore. That is true. But on the other hand, we were very careful as to measure exactly the color of the light, the intensity of the light of the functioning ones and to come to the same results in time, terms of light. So the effect is really the same as the, uh, the old light bulbs. In fact, the light is not anymore the same because we are using a different uh, technological, uh, technological solution. Yeah? So in this way, we were interfering. And luckily enough, we had the authorization of the artist uh, because otherwise it would have been a, quite a, a, little, a much more difficult question to resolve. Yeah? Because now we can say, together with the, the, the two sons of the artist, say, listen, this was as the artist um, um, authorized us to, yeah, to, to go on and to keep these machines functioning. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Peter. Uh, Tomiko, please. Yeah, I, I think I would address. There's a number of questions about, um, yeah, storyboarding or you know what sort of documentation. I think it would be it's it would be very very useful to do a video interview with the artist um, because the conservationist is going to answer question ask questions that the artist might not even think about, and the artist might also voice concerns that the conservationist wouldn't think about. So that sort of of uh, dialogue, uh, much more so than uh, filling out, you know, some form or, you know, uh, being told to write something down. Also, because, of course, not all artists, um, you know, I, I went out and wrote an academic paper. It was my first academic paper, and I don't like writing academic papers. And some people can't do it or won't do it. So, you know, you need uh, also, uh, you know, in the same way that 
you know, people learn, some people learn better when they hear something, some people better when they read something, some people better when they're shown something. In the same way, an artist will be able to talk more about their work in a different modality, depending on what person they are. So, so definitely, you know, what the other two have been saying, use all the modalities you have to, uh, to try and, and get more information. And, and, you know, storyboarding uh, is in, in the sense of, of, of you know me narrating the user ex experience, uh, how how you know what happens when you first come in the space? What are you supposed to be feeling? What can you explore? What directions can you go? Um, and uh, you know, I mean, the whole thing could be very very long, and so it's what ends up getting put on paper is much uh, shorter than the optimal. But maybe you know having. Uh, uh, having a, uh, a walkthrough with, for instance, a conservationist um, uh, being reported in, in video uh, so that it becomes a, concert, a conversation and a back and forth uh, with, you know, someone who, who, you know, knows the work too well because they created it and someone who's looking from the outside and, uh, and is curious to understand more about it. I think that would be extremely, extremely fruitful. And I actually haven't done that really with them. Um, uh, so much with any any of the projects, but uh, I'm going to suggest it to the Whitney. Uh, thank you, Tamiko. Well, uh, unfortunately, you should close the session, the section today, but uh, the discussion uh, continues. I think that. Well, uh, I I find it very difficult to summarize and conclu conclude the section. Uh, I think that preservation of media arts allow, allow us to really understand the idea of the complex and delicate system proposed by Deborah Hess, in which she highlights the law of interdependence of ecology, in which everything is connected, connected and mixed with everything you are in it together. I think it's, that's it. Um, thank you very much, uh, the presentation, Annette. <laughs> And, and um, thank, you, thank you very much, Annette, for talking about uh, contextualization, because I think that's some, something that I hadn't sort of thought of in that way. And I think that that's exactly right. I think you're dead on. Thank you very much. I don't know if, if, if you have more, uh, one more thing to, to say, or Annette, Peter, to close the section. It's very rewarding and very, uh, I learned a lot, both from Tamiko and from Annette. I certainly will contact Annette because um, I think I need some guidance how to preserve the, 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 the idea of the works of Palachniki specifically. Huh? Um, and, and the ways I can leave this for uh, further generations in some way, somewhere, because here in Brazil we have a very fragile system if we talk about archives. Uh, mm -hmm. And so uh, this is something uh, we can think about. And maybe uh, there are many people in Brazil uh, like uh, Magali and others who are thinking about it, uh, about conservation, about, but there is no central point where we can leave our, uh, our experience, uh, our uh, thoughts. And I think that would be great. And maybe uh, the file festival has uh, to taken this um, initiative uh, to talk about this for three days. And I think this is very rich and they can also be very helpful in um, bringing me uh, on the right track. Thank you. I mean, I think, yeah, maybe Brazil doesn't have the sort of right infrastructure from how we view indeed the conservation mm -hmm. of these artworks. But I think Brazil has something perhaps even more valuable in the long term and that's living history. Uh, it's an oral cultures which is a very strong also really present in Brazil and I think that's where we actually can learn a lot from it's going back indeed well how do you indeed tell stories and how do you preserve memory through indeed uh, remembering yeah Indian tribes yeah. 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 look here the Indian art on my wall exactly. Indian tribes <laughs> they, they they are purely oral huh? exactly exactly yeah. well uh, so um, 
we thank uh, everyone, everyone for their participation. And remember né, um, that the, the, vi uh, the videos, videos will be available, available on the platform. So, and um, thank you very much for the audience. <laughs> Thank you.